Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, Transforming Breast Cancer Together webinar. It's my great pleasure to be a moderator for today and to be joined by excellent uh, experts in the, in the field uh, to discuss with you if, what lessons can we learn from the COVID-19 pandemic and use it as a blueprint to improve breast cancer care. I think by now, uh, everyone is very much aware that COVID-19 pandemic brought severe disruptions to healthcare systems and that many patients, particularly the most fragile patients, such as cancer patients, have had a huge impact on their lives because of the pandemic. Screening programs were stopped or hugely delayed all over Europe. Even access from symptomatic patients was very difficult uh, during uh, a lot or most of the year 2020 in many uh, European countries. This has led to misdiagnosis or delayed diagnosis and late presentations. And we all know that, that for any type of cancer, early detection is key and can be the difference between a possibility of cure or uh, unfortunately death. So um, early diagnosis is key and is probably what was mostly affected by the difficulty to access healthcare by uh, European citizens. So this will have consequences in the mortality and we will see this consequence not just this year, but in the next years to come. However, this pandemic also brought some opportunities and some lessons learned. We have seen <clears throat> the big impact that the use of telemedicine can have. It doesn't solve every problem, but it, it is a very uh, important ally uh, for us to decrease the number of needed visits to the hospital, allowing the patient to continue as much as possible his or her life. We have also see, uh, have seen less bureaucracy and much faster implementation of clinical trials. And this has led to a much faster development of treatments such as the vaccines against COVID-19. And we also saw a much faster approval of these treatments that we very much would like to see as well in the field of oncology. And for that, it was crucial that the research community all over Europe and all over the world got together, but it was also crucial that it was political will to speed up all the process from the research in the lab until the benefit of the patient. So we will discuss uh, a little bit about what lessons we can be learned and how can we apply what we have learned for the next pandemics, because unfortunately, we are all also aware that it's possible and probable that this will happen again. And personally, I leave with a little bit note of concern because we could have learned already some of these lessons from the first wave to the second wave to the third wave. And this has not happened, at least not um, uniformly uh, all over Europe. So having set the scene now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speech, MEP Francis Fitzgerald. So MEP Fitzgerald is an MEP from Dublin, and she is our very dear chair of the Transforming Breast Cancer Together initiative. She has served previously in the Breast Cancer Foundation at St. Vincent's Hospital and also was the vice chair of uh, Europa Donna. She has been a parliamentary for over 20 years and has had numerous positions that I will not go into the detail, but I would like to highlight that she has always fought very hard for women's rights and gender equality and has been one of the most relevant and first women being in certain of the, those positions. And that leaves us very proud and very uh, she has become the Vice President of the European Parliament. So it's a great honor for us to have her with us. And please, Francis, we are very keen to hear you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Fatima, Dr. Fatima Cardoza. I, I've heard you speak so often on these issues and you're such a leader yourself and indeed the members of the panel. So I, I'm delighted to be here as chair of the Transforming Breast Cancer Together. 
And uh, as it says on the tin, it's about all of us working together. It's about uh, frontline physicians. It's about advocates. It's about uh, representatives of the pharmaceutical industry. It's about all of us coming together, politicians, because that's really how we get the best uh, results, in my view, when we have this kind of collaboration and the whole cancer area uh, needs this and really benefits from this type of collaboration, as we've seen. Uh, Fatima has talked about the goal of our session today. It's very much to say, how can we improve breast cancer care going forward? How can we learn the lessons of the pandemic? And how can we use those lessons to advance breast cancer care in the EU? And I, we have learned a lot. I mean, it's been very tragic, but we've also seen very interesting initiatives. And the question is, as Fatima has said, can we learn quickly enough uh, the lessons of the pandemic so that we improve indeed broader healthcare, but also cancer care? And that is um, what we're doing today. It's part, of course, of European Week uh, against cancer, it runs until the 31st of May. And the aim of that is to encourage everyone across Europe uh, to take action to achieve a Europe free of cancer. That's the vision, it's the right vision to have. There is much we can do, a lot more public awareness needed all of the time in relation to symptoms, early intervention, uh, prevention, and so on. But I think it's very timely a year into the pandemic that we review the lessons and we have to analyze what's happened and then we have to say, how do we move forward? And that's the goal of today. Now we know that cancer patients, as Fatima said, were particularly affected. The World Health Organization in its most recent report on COVID has said that cancer screening was the most disruptive service, 49% of 86 countries. That's very serious in itself, that disruption, because we know what disruption uh, means. It means that there were seriously delayed uh, numbers uh, of delayed diagnosis and cancer treatment, 36% of 86 countries. And the big point, of course, is that everybody was afraid to go to hospitals. And that fear still lingers with all of the consequences. And we have to interrupt that fear, uh, despite some lingering concerns, despite new waves, new variants, we have to make sure that people get to hospitals and that hospitals have the sort of pathways that give the reassurance that's needed. The European Parliament's special committee on beating cancer, known as BECA, reached the same conclusion. In a recent report, it said the study concluded that pandemic during the pandemic, cancer services were significantly impacted across the entire cancer care continuum with significant delays or cancellations leading to backlogs. It can be very difficult now uh, to get screening. There are long delays in many places, perhaps not for the most urgent cases, but a lot of the scans are, have long waiting lists in both public and private services. And we know that breast cancer patients are particularly at risk. Um, obviously the WHO announced that breast cancer tops the list of the most commonly diagnosed cancers worldwide, surpassing all other cancers in uh, EU 27 countries. And it's 13.3% of all new cancer cases diagnosed in 2020. So it's one in six deaths of all cancer uh, care among uh, women, cancer care deaths amongst women. So look, we know COVID-19 will leave its mark. And that's kind of, if you like, the, the analysis of the impact. The question is now, how do we get effective interventions going forward? And how do we make sure that early prevention and early detection are integrated into cancer care across all of our member states so that we can mitigate that potential surge. That's what this session is all about, because we know that delays have to be avoided because they are so serious. So we have to look at continuity of care. Uh, four months ago, the Beating Cancer Plan was published. I would say politically, uh, there is huge support across the European Parliament, indeed the Commission, and with our commissioners uh, to keep cancer care centre stage. And I think that's really important that that political commitment is there, is very present at present. But we want to make sure there are no delays in the implementation of that plan. So we have to collaborate with all stakeholders, including the recently launched WHO Global Breast Cancer Initiative, because it is all, as I said at the very beginning, it's about these multi-sectoral partnerships, working with uh, citizens working with patients, making sure that the advocacy groups have a strong voice and are heard 
um, in going uh, forward. So we want to draw the lessons from the pandemic. We want to learn more about the effects the pandemic has had on cancer care, but how do we become more resilient? Because we want this to be a priority, to raise awareness. We want to work together internationally like today, regionally, uh, European, global, to make sure that the voice of cancer patients is heard. It's very hard for any other voices to be heard at present other than those in relation to COVID, understandably to a degree. But we have to have a twin track approach. We can't simply have the discussion about COVID. We must continue to have access, particularly to make sure patients feel safe, supported, have access to treatment, uh, uh, to screening and to treatment, because we know, as I've said, we have to continue our collective efforts to tackle the disease now. So the key challenges going forward will be dealt with by our expert panel from the different perspectives I have mentioned. And I hope valuable lessons and guide, a guide can be given as to how we make sure that we learn the lessons, but move forward. Thank you, Fatima. Thank you very much for this very um, warm welcome and very important points that you raised in your, in your opening speech. So without any further ado, we go, we're going to move to the panel discussion. And I'll be joined by three very important ladies and very uh, experts uh, from the different perspectives that you, you can uh, have a look at this uh, problem. So I will be introducing them and then ask a, a more general question to each of them. And then we uh, would like very much that all of you that are listening will send in your own questions and comments using the Q&A uh, uh, facility of Zoom so that we, we can receive your comments and questions and then also discuss it with the panel members. So um, first in our panel member is uh, Tanya Sp Spanik. So Tanya, uh, was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2008, and she has become a very powerful and strong advocate for breast cancer patients, particularly young women with breast cancer. She is also currently the president of Europa Donna, and she is herself a doctor of veterinary medicine and has a PhD in neuroscience. Thank you, Tanya, for uh, joining us. And we'd like to ask you, uh, from the patient perspective, what do you consider have been the biggest challenges, but also the opportunities for cancer patients during this pandemic? And if you think that the challenges and opportunities have been equal for all European uh, cancer patients. Tanya. Hello, and uh, thank you, Fatima, for this very nice introduction and for invitation and giving me opportun the, the opportunity to be with you today. Yes, so definitely. We heard so many words already about COVID and we suddenly were all together in this. No one was prepared for this and especially not uh, vulnerable uh, communities like cancer patients. Um, Europa Dona is one of the biggest and one of the oldest uh, patient organization in Europe was also in touch with our member countries all the time. What we saw was that all countries were very unprepared. It was a shock for everybody. The health systems crashed or stopped. Uh, cancer facilities were closed. Patients couldn't reach their doctors. So the fear was even growing and growing. We were in touch with our members to see what's happening in different countries. And there were huge diversities, but all patients experienced a lot of fear and even more than normally during the treatment. They were afraid that the treatment will stop. What will happen with them? That the treatment will be delayed or canceled or the, the surgeries were delayed or canceled. And th this was producing more and more fear and uncertainty. Of course, even as a pa cancer patient, you are uh, immunosuppressed anyway. So they were even more afraid of getting COVID itself and maybe getting the complication and again delaying the treatment. It was a huge um, burden on the patients and not just on the patients, on the whole system. What we saw in different countries, actually the health system didn't provide so-called maybe clean or COVID-free pathways for cancer patients. Some countries luckily done that. I can say for Slovenia, country where I come from, we luckily had the cancer treatment all the time, but we know that many 
European member countries didn't have the same opportunity. Screening programs, as we already heard, were stopped. At least in the first wave, most of the countries stopped them. What that means, we still don't know. As Fatima already mentioned at the beginning, we will see these numbers and maybe a late diagnosis and increase in death rate in years, 10 years from now. So everything was, was tried to be cut up in the second part of the last year. But as we had a contact with our members, we saw that that wasn't the true. Maybe it was in some big cancer uh, centers, but not in remote areas and access to, to the, the health system wasn't the same as it was before the uh, pandemic. But there were also some positive sides. Our NGOs, so non-governmental organizations, patient organizations organized them, themselves pretty fast. We moved all of our activities online and on the phone. We were calling our patients. We were calling our communities, trying to try to support them. We saw a huge lack of psychosocial support. So these people were left there alone, so without treatment, without any support, without support to go to the, uh, to, for the shopping or anything. So we tried to encourage even our countries to, to organize themselves and to provide more of, of these facilities. It wasn't easy, but as we saw, women are very, very capable and they found all different new ways. ways. And also telemedicine, we hear it a lot nowadays or digitalization in the medicine. Uh, COVID was in a one way a big push for this. It was developing in the past 10 years, but suddenly in a few months, it, it just exploded. So everything moved online, on the phone, video conferences, and also some of the follow-ups. Some patients were capable to follow that, some not. Again, our organizations helped the patients to provide uh, even uh, computers, internet connection, uh, educated them how to use these new tools. And not just the patients, even all doctors capable to use it or didn't have enough uh, facility for doing that. So we had really adopt in a very quick time. But here maybe is one of the biggest opportunity what we can take out, what, which lesson we can take out of this COVID situation. So maybe not every time patient needs to go to the doctor office for regular follow-up or maybe uh, for just a concerning question. Now we can use these tools. And in many countries, now they can develop uh, an online or a digital prescription of the drug. So the patient doesn't need to go to the doctor's office just to pick the prescription for a drug for another treatment. We saw a huge, huge... Uh, development uh, of, in this area. And um, in, in not so many countries, not so underdeveloped countries, but in all countries, most of the clinical trials were delayed in cancer. In can I'm talking about cancer clinical trials are delayed or put on hold. And also these results we will see in a few years, not just today and tomorrow. Luckily they moved forward but they were all on stop. And in some cases, we even don't know what happened with all the patients during this uh, short pause. And one very important uh, community or society of women in, of breast cancer is BRCA carriers. Even for those women, they are in higher risk, even if they are just the carriers or already their pa patients themselves. All these special follow-ups follow were stopped. So no additional screenings, no additional visits. These patients now need to be taken care more carefully. Not to prevent more delays in the detection in progress in these women. This accounts for, for all patients, not just that. And not just that uh, special group. Uh, definitely what we've learned from this, that we have to maintain and uh, build the capacity of the healthcare system. So when this happens again, we can provide the clean, uh, pandemic clean, in this case, COVID clean pathways for uh, patients, for cancer patients, not just, not just for the pandemic patients. Uh, I think that this will be one of the biggest challenge because we know how um, rigid and stiff uh, healthcare systems are and how different they are in all the countries. 
but this will definitely be, be one of the challenge. And uh, last but not least, uh, I think that the whole community can come up with, with a very important message that we are not alone, that the whole society found themselves in this situation and we have to work together. As we saw already here, we have to work, the whole, the whole stakeholders have to work in these situations together, not just patient and healthcare providers, but also the policy makers, industry, and the countries that can provide all the infrastructure for the patients to make it run, run uh, freely and not stopping again, because this will bring us even more challenges in future years without any pandemic, we can get a cancer pan pandemic rising, rising again uh, when we suddenly saw that it was maybe already uh, more stable. This is so far from my side, thank you. Thank you so much, Tanya. Thank you for all the points that were are really very relevant. And so we move on to uh, Isabel Rubio. So Isabel is the head of uh, breast surgical oncology at the Clinica Universitat de Navarra in Madrid. She is a very well-known breast cancer expert and also a fighter for multidisciplinary management of breast cancer. She's active in many societies, has many roles. So I'll just pick two. She is uh, the, the president of ILZOMA, the European Society of Breast Cancer Specialists, and also the president-elect of the um, European Society of Surgical Oncology. And she's been working tirelessly uh, for the rights of breast cancer patients. So Isabel, uh, from the point of view of the healthcare professional, what has happened in the field uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic that had the biggest impact on patients, both a short-term and long-term. And I would also ask you to please also mention the impact that it had on healthcare professionals themselves. Please, Isabel. You're, you're mute, I need to connect. Thank you, thank you, Fatima. I'm really very honored to be here with this group of experts and working together against breast cancer. So let me just give you a couple of numbers that I think will put up everyone in the context of what cancer patients mean. And it's that in the first six months of last year, about half a million of people died from COVID, but 4 million of people died from cancer. So I think that the numbers says it all. And I think that um, because we didn't expect to have this pandemic and everything hit us so hard, we didn't have really ways of movement to, to become to all this tragedy. But let me tell you that I think that and I want to first say that the first thing we need to do is look inside and, um, and realize what have we done wrong. Because I think that, as you mentioned uh, at the beginning, um, of course, we have the first wave. But see, we are in the fourth wave, and we are still having the same problems as we had when we didn't know anything about the virus. Um, I think you know there are many arbitrary decisions that are being made. And I think that we need to fight this and we need to realize what is that we did that we cannot do anymore. And um, related to this, I think that one of the main problems in, in, in cancer patients has been the screening, but we just keep telling patients or women that they have to go for their mammograms annually or biannually or whatever the program they have in their country. But now, you know, it seems that we are not in a wave, so we are supposed to restart the screening, but the screening is not restarted completely. And there are a, a, a bunch of people waiting for the screen that they still is waiting for them because they are not going to call them now. They are calling the ones that are coming new. And, and, and what is the message that you get to the patient when you do that? The message is, well, you know, maybe a screen is not so important. If we can just skip the screening for a year and nobody cares, I mean, we'll just kind of skip it next year because, you know, I don't feel like going for a mammogram that I hate. So I think that the message to the patients need to be consistent. And if we, we want 
the awareness of, of primary prevention of early detention, we need from, the, from our health professionals point of view, give the message that this still is important and push the governments and push the whoever need to push this um, to restart the screening the way it is and, 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 and give the message that the, the women are expecting to have. This is important and we cannot skip it. So the, the huge pandemic is gone. I mean, we are still living with the virus and we may live, you know, I don't know how many years more, but we need to forget about the virus and go back to our screening programs, to our missing appointments. There are many, many patients who miss the appointment for the follow-up and, and it's gone. I mean, they never call them. And I also think that there is a, a huge thing that we cannot afford to do anymore is that when we have a, this uh, pandemic or we have another pandemic or whatever we have, we need to call our patients. I mean, when the hospital just crashed and, and, and there were so many patients that many people were involved in, in COVID care patients, but there were many other people who were not. I mean, and in those cases, those people should have called uh, the patients and let them know that everything was going to be okay and we will reschedule you and don't worry and I don't know send them some support because at the end you know ev ev everything was locked down nobody says anything and and the people just are afraid of everything and I think that it's our mission and maybe our obligation to do all these things so I think that's important thing the virtual support is good I mean we have learn how to talk to the patients by the phone or by Zoom or whatever, and it helps. But it's true that in some specialties, and cancer is one, unless there is just a follow up with a blood samples or whatever, the rest you need to explore the patient, you need to do a physical exam. So it's difficult to, to keep telemedicine in, in this situation. Maybe in other chronic type of disease, you could do that. I think also it's important in terms of, of um, the health professionals, and I'm talking now about uh, surgical training. I mean, um, we have for one year that none of the residents of the medical students can go to the OR, can do any surgical training because everything was locked down for three months. Nowadays, you cannot go to another hospital to, to learn a technique or to, to learn from some experts. And I think in that sense, it's good that uh, we have restarted really doing um, simulation models, uh, videos, uh, conferences, so you can learn how to do a surgical technique, uh, a cancer, a mastectomy without needing to go to the OR, you can do it with a simulation. So I think that in that part, that's good because that can complement the, the experience of being in the operating room I don't think it can just supply all, but you know, you can do a hybrid hybrid type of, of, of training. And I think that in terms of training, uh, that will help for the future generations. Um, I think that, you know, um, problem with the screening is the most, problem with the appointment is the most. And I think that if, if uh, we are into the Europe beating cancer plan and we really want to, to change this, the governments need to start taking care of all the screening that has not been done. And we need to do that now because, you know, it's been last year without the screening. If we keep this year going the way we go, we will have two years without any screening, um, any breast, any colon, any cervical, anything. So, so I think for me, that will be the most important thing. And then, and I just want to finish by saying that it's also important that um, the health professional tell the patients to be um, aware about the importance of the primary prevention, exercise, and all related to that. Of course, you can say, well, you know, we are in a lockdown, but even in a lockdown, we should have had the, the way of telling the patient, hey, you can do exercise and, you know, be more innovative or be more support to the patient. So I think that in a way, you know, there are some parts that we need to blame um, the governments, but other parts, I think that the health professionals and the hospitals and all the environment should learn that um, we need to, to, to stop and think and, and work on the things that we didn't do well and we can do better. Thank you, Isabel. Also a very important 
call of attention to everyone involved that um, everyone can do better. Thank you. So um, go and now move to uh, Brigitte, Brigitte Nollet. Uh, she's the general manager for Roche, uh, Belgium and Luxembourg. She has been working in the pharmaceutical environment from almost 14 years and has very uh, different leadership roles. And importantly, she has worked with many patient groups and has also been involved in global policy, working with global institutions such as the World Bank and the World Health Organization. So uh, Bridget, welcome uh, to our uh, webinar. Please tell us from your point of view, what, has be, what have been the biggest challenge, but also the opportunities for breast cancer patients during this pandemic? Yeah, thank you so much for the kind introduction and thank you for having me. I'm deeply inspired by the speakers that we've just heard from and I've learned things already today and perspectives I haven't really thought through such as the residency perspective Dr. Rubio that you just brought forward for me opening my eyes and I just really appreciate the theme of learning that you've brought forward because I think we owe it to today's and tomorrow's cancer patients to learn as much as we can out of this situation to really fully address the European burden and to improve outcomes for cancer patients. Dr. Cardoso, I think you said it very well, COVID-19 has had an alarming impact on patient access to cancer care, and it's been very difficult. And at the same time, it has brought some learnings that we must take forward with us. And I think the challenge for all of us is to look beyond the current crisis and really think about how we can future-proof our healthcare systems into the future and take those learnings with us. And so perhaps there's, there's four areas that I would wanna concentrate on on behalf of uh, the industry. And, and the first Dr. Rubio is in your spirit of consistency that you talked about, and that is the importance of testing and diagnosis. And I think every speaker has referenced it and I think it is that important for all of us. Uh, MEP Fitzgerald mentioned the WHO report, and I think that's very enlightening in terms of that impact, the disrupted impact of cancer screening. And I think if we've learned anything out of COVID, it's the importance of testing and the importance of diagnosis, timely diagnosis to be able to manage such a public health threat. And the same applies to breast cancer treatment. How do we work together to really ensure that breast cancer screening is at a pillar in that work and that we are thinking of all of the proper diagnostic tools from biomarker testing to genomic profiling. How do we work to make sure that patients are able to get that screening and then access the most relevant medicine for them as they go forward? The second key learning for, for me is the important role of health data and the secondary use of health data, not only within our countries, but I think across Europe as well. COVID has taught us that sharing health data, it can hold the same advancements as diagnostics and treatments. We need to, it, it's a big learning for us. I think we need to think about health data the way, almost as a new pillar in our healthcare systems. It has great potential if data can be used and shared safely and combined in order to derive insights. Imagine what would happen in terms of this past year and a half if our health data insights could have been shared faster across countries and how it would have helped us with some of the public health decision-making. So when it comes to health data, it really is about sharing that will help us move forward. And a truly transformative healthcare system needs a robust, unified, secure bank of data. And I think that's where the private sector and the public sector can come together to really work on that partnership solution and it's an area that I know the EU is looking at with their health data space. And I think it is deeply linked to the beating cancer plan. And I think that's wonderful in terms of our learnings and how we can take that forward. I believe the European uh, beating cancer plan points that 30% of the world's stored data is currently produced by our health systems. And if that's the case, then I think there's no doubt that we can unlock some potential in data and technology and analytics in healthcare that will really help us think about solutions for the future, uh, the future of care and the future of outcomes for patients. And that maybe takes me to the third piece, which is the concept of digital health that you have all raised. Um, Tanya, I think you spoke to it in particular in terms of how digital health has brought 
healthcare to the patient at home and how we've been able to really understand in the pandemic how interconnected our healthcare systems actually are and the power of digital health and technologies. And I think you spoke of it in terms of consultations and being able to support patients. I also wonder if there is room for us to also think about how we could bring care safely to the home. And I know many European countries have been looking at this healthcare at home concept. I know we are in Belgium as well. And I think that this is something that we can learn and continue to explore. How do we safely bring the medicines to the patient as well so that they can continue to move forward and we can continue with adherence. Now that doesn't replace face-to-face -face consultation and Dr. Rubio is quite correct. That will always be a foundation of care, but how can we help really think through how digital health can find its place in the patient journey and how clinical informatics can help advance healthcare. I think that that would be wonderful. And one of you mentioned as well, clinical trials. And I know digital health has also been a real learning for us in terms of even running clinical trials remotely, we've learned how to do in the past year and a half, which we never would have imagined being able to do previously. So it is something that we have to continue to evolve and learn but it is something that we take with us as a big learning. And that maybe takes me to the final point, Dr. Cardoso, which is the concept of regulatory efficiencies. And one of you mentioned, you know, not only are there new diagnostics and new treatments and vaccines that were brought forward in COVID-19 in record time, regulatory approaches and new processes also evolved with us so that we could ensure working with government, we could bring forward these new healthcare solutions. And as someone who started her career in the Canadian federal government, you know, I know the importance of sound policies and processes. And I think the question is, what did we learn and how do we take that forward in our, um, in our drug development and also in the way that we bring forward medicines with the public sector to society. And so that concept of regulatory approvals, you know, with COVID-19, we saw really interesting sped up regulatory approval times without compromising safety and efficacy. And that was done by working with the public sector, with our regulatory experts in terms of early dialogue, rolling submissions. And these are things we can take with us in terms of new cancer therapies. How can we take those learnings and apply them to new medicines, new health breast cancer treatments, and ensure that we're bringing the best possible care as fast as we can. So those are the four lessons, Dr. Cordosa, and I'm just gonna conclude with where MEP Fitzgerald concluded. She spoke to collaboration. And I think that where you have all of these speakers together today, I think you have that essence of collaboration among all of us. In a public health crisis, it is all about a common purpose. And I think, and I stand um, on behalf of the industry to say that you have our collaboration in the fight against breast cancer. And we're really looking forward to continuing our work together in the future. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your points and those are very important. And I, I will perhaps now launch a, a question that any of you could, could answer, but I would ask uh, uh, MEP Fitzgerald for her thoughts on this. So we have heard in very important less in the lessons learned that if we are all with the same goal, and we want to speed up all the different steps of a process. So clinical trial done faster with less bureaucracy, less demanding for the patient. Uh, also approval, regulatory uh, approvals faster without compromise of what is necessary for the safety. And then also uh, that implementation in the different countries because sometimes we have regulatory approval from the European agency, but then it lags in all the different countries with some countries having very fast access and others taking, for example, my country where the, on average, a treatment reaches more than two years after EMA approval, it is uh, approved in Portugal. So how can we as a group and the community, how can we help uh, the policymakers and politicians to make these learnings implemented so that we can now use them also in the oncology world. What can we do? What, what can be changed uh, and, and make this so that we don't 
go back to what we were before the pandemic? I mean, it's, it's a fascinating question, Fatima, and thank you for putting it to me. I mean, I, I think there's, look, at it's a complicated scenario, but I do think um, there is reason, you know, to be optimistic uh, in the sense of when you see the response to the pandemic. Okay, there were delays and so on. But, you know, I'm tempted to think about that phrase, don't tell me what your values are. Tell me where you put your money and I'll tell you what your values are. And I, I think that, you know, in terms of the way that, I think one of the things we've learned very, very much at, in Europe is that, you know, we always used to think of health as a national competence. It's absolutely clear. It is not, you know, it can't be a national competence. It is an international competence. It is a European competence. We are only get, going to get, you know, uh, the resolutions to many of these issues if we work at a European level. So if you look at the pandemic and you look at the research, the money that went into it, you know, tell me your, you know, show me where you put your money and I'll tell you your values. Look at the money that went in. Look at the results we got when the priority was there. Look at the contrast in COVID deaths and, and uh uh, and the deaths from cancer, you know, keeping cancer top of that policy agenda because of the seriousness of the of, of it as a as a health concern and the numbers of in, in, impacted the citizens, the families, the communities. So it's it's about I think, I mean, it is about not going back to normal, and I think there could be a tendency for that. It is about really, uh, Dr. Rubio talked about perhaps specialists maybe in a way could have reached out more to particular groups of patients. And I mean, that's not to blame. That's just an interesting observation of the way COVID uh, 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 you know, took over. And, and yet the lessons are about you know, maybe home care, about health care at home, as, as Birgitta has talked about. Um, I think it's also, you know, about the lessons of technology, etc. Now, your question is, how do we make sure that this happens? I, I think it's the old story. It's not any one thing. I, I think information still, uh, public awareness. Um, and I think you know, one of the good things, by the way, I have so much to say on this. One of the good things, Fatima, is that science has become more centre stage, uh, science and technology. And, you know, let's get away from false news. Uh, the science and technology, the respect for experts like we have on this panel today, the respect for experts and experts. And it's, it's not in their training necessarily to be, you know, public advocates. But I think the expert role in advocating, both in describing what's happened to cancer patients, but now in terms of encouraging increased resources and reaching out so that we make up for the gaps uh, that, you know, Tanya spoke about that individual patients have experienced. Because, you know, people, it's the easiest thing in the world to put off the screening, even if you are uh, if you think, you know, the, the countries are catching up, but also to make it a political priority. Like, I think we all have to work together to ensure that coping with the impacts of the pandemic on cancer is a political priority. That is not easy, Fatima, given the focus still on COVID. I mean, we're not hearing very much in our media, generally speaking, about cancer at the moment. We do our best in specialists. Uh, areas and special as specialists but I think we have to broaden out this debate I think we can all play a part in this and advocacy of course is one of the individual story nothing beats it so I think in some ways it's about making sure that we we get that story out there and we demand the kind of screening that will save lives and the acceleration in the same way that we talked about 24 hour care for pandemic and 24 hour testing. Actually, that's what we need to do for cancer now uh, to make sure we catch up. So I, I think we probably need a very clear list of demands, Fatima, and we can help do that in our organization as well. So, you know, there, there's lots of factors. It's no one simple one, but those are the thoughts that strike me right now about it. Thank you, Francis, for having said something. I really believe that health cannot be just a national matter. It has to be dealt with nationally and internationally. Tanya, how can we stimulate our national politicians <laughs> to take the needed decisions to not go back to what we were previously, but to go back to a better normal, 
for cancer patients? Yes, uh, definitely. We we have to keep keep going with our work, as we already heard something prevention, prevention, awareness, and early detection of the disease. But what I want to point out that this uh, here is that not just screening is very important. Isabel mentioned it uh, briefly. Not all women are in screening programs, so we must not forget the women younger or older of that age. We have to also encourage them to do the prevention screening, to self-examine examine themselves and go to doctor if they feel that there's something wrong, not wait at home and see what's going to happen. So again, raising awareness, doing these campaigns for healthy lifestyle, as Isabel mentioned, work, work out at home, exercise at home. There are a lot of Zoom videos, YouTube videos, do it. You can do it in your living room or on your balcony, wherever you want. And this is very important thing that we must not forget about, even during the situations like that, when uh, the stress is even higher, especially already in uh, patients. So how to get politicians on our side? Go there and tell them our stories and work together as we do, share our, share our um, experiences, share our good practices, and uh, show them what can be done. Definitely breast cancer one is one of the most common cancers in the world. And we must not forget, not just women are diagnosed, also men can get diagnosed. And sometimes, unfortunately, most politicians are men. And when they hear this information that also they can get diagnosed, they get a little bit shocked. So maybe sometimes we can use some facts like that to get their attention. Uh, not just you know giving the same um, information all all over uh, all over again. So um, I think that we will not get out of uh, work. Uh, definitely, there is much more to do. But I think that we really have to look uh, deeply in this uh, pandemic situation. Take all the lessons learned. Improve our healthcare systems. Work together all stakeholders and move forward if this happens again definitely cancer uh, cancer uh, provide cancer care must not be stopped even screening not just breast screening all screenings as we heard uh, this has to continue regarding what happens and we have to learn how to live with situations like pandemic like covid and something new whatever it comes Thank you, Tanya. And I hope this um, answer for Tanya from Tanya also provides uh, insights to the question we have received from Banya Shirawi from India on how we could engage politicians for a wider reach. And uh, I just take that opportunity to remind everyone to please send in your questions and we will try to uh, address them. So Isabel, you talked about some things that could have been done better or more often by uh, the healthcare providers themselves. And um, I find that at least here in my country, it's still hard to get hold of your uh, family doctor, your GP. So, so if in some sectors, healthcare providers are still not available. What can we do to increase that? Because we all know the crucial role that GPs have on both prevention, screening, early diagnosis. So how can we stimulate them to go back to work with full time and full dedication? Well, that's, that's a good point because I really think that one of the, of the most workloaded Specialist now is the is the primary care physicians. Not only because they have all this amount of patients, but also because in some places vaccination is being done at the primary care physicians' facilities. So you know everything is you know everybody has so many things to do. Um, I think I am confident that with the vaccination, uh, people will. Uh, realize that we have a life again okay and i think that that one of the problems for all for all for patients uh, healthcare professionals for everybody is that we are so we've been so afraid of everything 
that we don't really care about anything. We just care about the virus. We don't care about politics. We don't care about the different regulations. We don't care about anything. We don't care about, well, you feel bad and well, let's wait because, so I think that with the vaccination, I hope that people, that we as patient advocates, healthcare professionals, policymakers, politicians realize that we have a life beyond the virus. And in that way, I think that that we can manage better on the, the primary physicians um, calls because what they have realized in the primary care physicians is that the telemedicine is working. So there are many chronic diseases that that you know they just they just go have the blood pressure taken, have the blood drawn, and they just talk to the doctor. And, and I think that in that way the telemedicine in the primary care is going to work much better. But I also think that in a way we all need to, to make awareness of, of all the things that we need and make awareness of, of how to prevent breast cancer and other cancers and make awareness of, 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 of other issues in, in life that we are now missing. So let me say that I think that people are now still a little bit asleep and, and just frightened, but I think that as soon as the, the frontiers are open, that we can travel, that we can go there, come and, and forget a little bit about this. I think that we can go back to, to, to raise awareness. Patient advocates can still be asking for more, more resources for, for uh, all the healthcare programs that we need. So I think that in that way, we just need to pass the summer and I am confident that you know, you know, everybody will be more energetic and wanting to do. And just one, one thing, we need to get benefit from the Europe beating cancer plan because that's an European thing. But I don't want that European thing to stay European. We need to find a way that all those regulations, recommendations, guidelines, everything gets into the national programs. And I think that that's for me, the implementation is one thing that we will need to make sure that it's gonna happen. Because if not, people will be really disappointed that we have lost the opportunity to implement what the European Beating Cancer Plan is recommending in the countries. Thank you, Isabel. I think that's a very crucial uh, take home message is that we finally have a European uh, cancer plan but now we have to make it our own in each individual member state. And who knows, perhaps this plan can also be a sort of inspiration for other countries outside Europe, but it's a huge step forward and we need to implement all of us together uh, that plan in our uh, individual uh, countries. So Bridget, uh, one question for you regarding the role of our, or, or the role and also the enthusiasm of the pharmaceutical uh, company uh, partners on speeding up the, the process of clinical trials. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned that we might go back to what it was before the pandemic. And um, there is a very interesting uh, publication about not making being a cancer patient a full-time job. So cancer patients are not patients, uh, being a patient is not their job. They have their own professional and personal lives. And sometimes when you are in a clinical trial, it seems that you, it is a full-time job. You are all the time at the hospital. So do you think there is a willingness from the pharmaceutical companies and also from the regulators to help facilitate inclusion in trials and make them um, more patient-centered. I think that's the opportunity in front of us is that we've learned in the past year and a half that we can, despite the disruption that we saw, particularly in wave one, we learned how to use technology and really move forward with uh, our clinical trials remotely. And these are learnings that we can take with us into other disease areas. And I think to the questions that you've asked about how how can we work at the country level? I think that these are, these are learnings that are both European wide and country level. We are and we can work with our regulators and our uh, public sector colleagues to really understand how to take a learning like that, remote clinical trial development, 
not every aspect, but a lot of those aspects in development can move forward in that way. And how can it become the most efficient um, as we can make it into the future? So absolutely, I think that, that you've, you've highlighted one of the key opportunities to take with us. And if I can just um, reiterate and also just support the comments that have been made, I think that the Europe, uh, Europe's Beating Cancer Plan is also a real opportunity for all of us as collaborators. And that's the one thing we can take with us across Europe and within our countries. How can we all partner together to help make that a success? And even the EU health data space and the leadership we've seen from the EU in health data, how can we link that into the cancer plan and make that come to fruition? These are big opportunities because I think screening, as you pointed out, was important, but equal access to, to healthcare solutions across Europe is also a fundamental value and a fundamental object, objective we all have. And how can we work together to really think that through on behalf of of those suffering from breast cancer. So thank you, thank you for the question. Thank you for the opportunity today. I'm really inspired by the passion of the group. Thank you very much. And uh, time flies when we are having fun. So <laughs> I'm, uh, we are about to finish our webinar. Thank, I want to thank uh, Isabel and Tanya that have been answering to some of your in the Q&A part. Uh, some of them were very specific, but I think we've highlighted most of the important comments that you made. Um, and we hope that no, nobody from the attendees was left without an answer to their questions. And it's my uh, role now to summarize in two minutes uh, what we have heard and what we have to do uh, for the next few years. So I will ask the the help of uh, the organizers just to put up the slide and to tell you that we as Transforming Breast Cancer Together have renewed our call for change and call for action and this will be made available publicly available uh, this week which is um, the week dedicated to cancer and you will see there nine recommendations on where to focus to move um, the, the, the quality of breast cancer care. And in fact, if you look carefully, all that we have used breast cancer as our focus and example, but many of these recommendations can be adapted and influence all types of cancer. So invest in primary and secondary prevention when possible, but also provide access to the best available care which in cancer has to be a multidisciplinary and specialized care. It can no longer be an individual physician taking care of cancer patients. And we have heard as well that a word that came out of almost all the speakers is fear. Everybody is fearful and everybody is living with uncertainty. And I uh, will finish by telling you that some of the cancer patients have said, well, finally, everybody that is not a cancer patient understands how we live all the time because fear and uncertainty is with a, a cancer patient all over the journey. And so I think that the whole world can now understand better what, what it means to live with cancer, to live with metastatic cancer, for example, that has no cure, or to live with the uncertainty that the cancer can come back that you can have a relapse. So our call is mostly that, okay, let's continue to fight all the diseases, but let's not forget the one that kills the more European uh, people. And, and that is of course cancer, which is even uh, in the majority of European countries, overcoming cardiovascular diseases as the most important cause of death. And this is not going to decrease. The expectations is that very, very soon, in less than 10 years, one out of two Europeans will get at least one cancer during their lifetime. So um, I hope that we all get together. And in our group, uh, we are certainly all working together, looking into the problem with different eyes, the eyes of the patient, the eyes of the professionals, the eyes of the companies, the eyes of the policymakers and politicians that have the power to make the changes happen. So I hope that we can 
um, fill everyone out there with this um, willingness to collaborate. And I'll finish like Francis has said, collaboration of all the stakeholders that are needed so that we can really make a change for uh, breast cancer and all cancer patients. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you, Isabel. And thank you to all that have provided the technical support for us to be here today and all the attendees. I hope this was useful for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you Bye. Thank you. Everyone. Bye. Bye.